I found uh, the country very different in that uh, it was much more built up. The roads were bigger. Unfortunately, there was a lot less trees. Um, but one thing I found that was similar was the friendliness of the Vietnamese people, and especially since this time they were not shooting at us. The scars left by the Vietnam War aren't always visible. Outside Ho Chi Minh City lies a 200-kilometer tunnel network dug by the communist guerrillas. Capable of withstanding the weight of a 60-ton tank or a 100-kilo bomb, these tunnels were an ideal hiding place for hundreds of guerrillas. They lived for months in these dark, cramped quarters directly beneath a U.S. Army base camp and surfaced at night from hidden trap doors to strike against the enemy and then disappear as if into thin air. Symbols of the war can be found in the most unlikely places. One of the unforgettable images of the period was the Buddhist monk who set himself on fire on a street in Saigon. The act of protest was captured on the front pages of newspapers around the world. The war came to an end when Viet Cong tanks crashed through the gates of the residence of the former president of South Vietnam. The French were there before the Americans, and their colonial influence is still very apparent, from the performing arts to cuisine, from architecture to religion. The legacy that has lasted more than a hundred years also manifests itself in elegant old world hotels, as well as palatial villas in residential areas. And this tomb in the forest. Sometimes an occupier, sometimes a benefactor, China, the giant neighbor to the north, has had a much deeper influence on Vietnam than any other country. The father of modern Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh, was able to evict the French with China's help and lay the groundwork for the reunification of North and South. In spite of changing attitudes, his mausoleum in Hanoi remains a national shrine. The same can't be said of the Lenin statue built when Vietnam was a willing proxy of the former Soviet Union. That statue and the power it represents looks increasingly out of place today. Well, I must begin by saying that we started our restructuring, which is Doi Mai, as early as 1982. But since we were not that sure of what to do, so we, we experiment. We, shall I say, by trial and error, we try to find out a way of managing the country. And now we have something which I might call market socialism. It simply means that we blend both the market economy and the planet economy. But before doing that, we have undertaken at least four fundamental reforms. The first one is reform in management. The second one is reform in banking. The third one, reform in our external economic relations. And lastly, we had promulgated this investment law for the foreign investors. And in this law, we guarantee against nationalization by the government. Also, we guarantee against unfair competition. The foreign investors can come into any area he cares to do. He can also invest as much as he cares. It simply means 100% foreign capital. I think that if the newspaper continues, and I'm sure it will, that the central government is committed to the Doi Moi policy that they started in 1986. Um, that has continued and they've made progress and they've made radical changes to their constitution to allow things to happen, things to happen quickly. But that doesn't mean that everything will be smooth or simple because uh, it's a, it's a backward country, it's a country which has fought many wars and people don't understand what an investment is, a capitalist system is, and uh, in their attempt 
to take on Doi Moi and renovation, they're still trying to keep the political process separate to the economic one, and I think that's going to be a major problem for them. Shaped like an elongated letter S, this beautiful land, with a coastline stretching over 3,000 kilometres from north to south, and with a population of 68 million, is one of the poorest in the world. Scenes of pastoral harmony belie the harsh subsistence realities that 85% of the people face every day. Hue, Vietnam's most magnificent city, suffered extensive damage during the Tet Offensive of 1968. The Tai Hoa Palace is noted for its interior decorations in red lacquer and gold inlay. It was among the buildings of the forbidden Purple City, which were relatively unscathed. The emperors who rule this region spared no effort in aggrandizing their person with elaborate costumes and headdresses. The new and the traditional blend in this ancient land with a modern dressed Vietnamese woman respectfully burning incense as she worships a female Buddha. On the Perfume River stands a marvel, the Tien Mu Pagoda, a seven-story tower built in the mid-1800s to worship Buddha. Statues of elephants, horses and of military and civil mandarins grace one courtyard and then another that leads up to the tomb of Emperor Kai Din. On the ceiling of the middle chamber is an image of a dragon painted by artists using their feet. The life-size bronze statue of Kai Din made in France rests on a dais on top of the tomb. A hilltop monument marks the end of religious persecution of Roman Catholics during the Chinese occupation. Confucianism, Buddhism and Taoism are the principal religions of Vietnam. In most Vietnamese families, it's the responsibility of the eldest son to preside over incense offerings to the dead on anniversaries and traditional holidays. Statues of Buddha predominate here, but there are others as well. Vietnam's many rivers are the very essence of livelihood for the people. The Red River Delta is home to nine-tenths of the population of northern Vietnam. Together with the Mekong Delta, these river-fed regions produce most of Vietnam's rice supply. The majority of the people in the Mekong Delta are descendants of the Khmer ethnic group. They probably followed the river into the delta. The Mekong River, which has its source in Tibet, is one of the longest in Southeast Asia. The picturesque waterfront towns that huddle on the banks of this great river's tributaries do a bustling legitimate as well as black market trade. The opportunities for entertainment are limited. The ubiquitous video cafes have sprung up in villages to meet this need, depicting Hong Kong-made scenes of graphic gore. Is this a case of catharsis or just mindless entertainment? Whatever it is, these action-packed scenes seem to appeal to all ages. Vietnam is a nation of contrasts between rural and urban, between the ancient and the modern, and between the north and the south. Here, peasants spend a day at the market selling their rice. Subsistence fishermen work the rivers of the inner city, catching the evening meal for their hungry family. On the streets of Ho Chi Minh City, which the natives still call Saigon, the pace of life is much faster. The bicycles give way to motorcycles and more privately owned cars that you'd rarely see in the center of Hanoi. No matter where you look, the flow of humanity seems endless. Saigon is the business center of Vietnam. Its infrastructure and attitude are years ahead of Hanoi's. But then, so is the traffic congestion, the air pollution, and the urban angst. Unlike many Westerners, the Vietnamese know how to relax, whether it's badminton in a city park or Tai Chi inherited from the Chinese.
Tai Chi is a form of exercise which emphasizes muscle tone through graceful movement and breathing. It's typically practiced in the early morning by people of all ages and from all walks of life. Others find other ways of passing the time away. The center of life in the city is the horse, the open air market. And the question of what to buy or what to sell and how to sell it is manifested in every conceivable form. Whether in Hanoi or in Ho Chi Minh City, the Vietnamese have a natural gift for making the best of limited circumstances. The stores in Ho Chi Minh City display a greater selection, a legacy of history and also a result of its current thriving black market trade with Cambodia. This bustling market offers anything from eels to sausages. From silk to leather belts, exotic fruit, unfamiliar spices and a wide assortment of fish, reptiles, birds, most of them alive. If none of these meet your needs, then you might like to take a squealing pig home with you to slaughter at your leisure. Vietnamese cuisine is a combination of the familiar and the exotic. Connoisseurs may pick out one of these nocturnal winged creatures or assess a cobra's meatiness before it's slapped down on the chopping block. Chefs at the most elegant restaurants will parade the live beasts at your table for your perusal prior to their slaughter. Businessmen and tourists are usually the lucky recipients of these rituals. But whatever your choice, the outcome is always worthy of the suspense. Anyone fancy chicken feet? The much more casual outdoor restaurants serve a more pedestrian fare, but almost always just as delicious. Beef and noodle soup, or pho as it's called in Vietnamese, combined with nuoc mam, fish sauce and com, steamed rice, is a light and tasty dish. Vietnamese versions of fast food are widely available at city cafes and roadside or market stalls. Bootlegging also does a brisk business. And when they're not listening to Western music, the Vietnamese turn to their nation's traditional culture. Here, the singers, dressed in Ao Dai, the national dress of Vietnamese women, perform in a city center park. The so-called Reunification Express crawls along the single track between Hanoi and Saigon at 30 kilometers an hour, 13 kilometers an hour slower than on its maiden trip in the 1930s. The infrastructure is quite bad. So we have the first priority is that to do something here for the north, to build, to rebuild the infrastructure, the roads, the bridges, the harbors, the airports. But in the south it's different. So that the first priority I think is for the infrastructure of the country. The bus system runs a surprisingly extensive network, but they have to negotiate a hazardous passage. And when the roads are unsurpassable, what better way is there to travel than by water? Wars, isolation and socialism have contributed to Vietnam's backward infrastructure. It's difficult to move towards the future without paving the way first. But the nation may be on a threshold leaving these images of a crowded, dilapidated bus and battered and worn trucks in the dustbin of their history. At least air services are rapidly improving in Vietnam, with expanding airports in Hanoi, Da Nang and Ho Chi Minh City. Air France was used to be the only carrier carrying cargo to, to, to Europe. Meanwhile, Lufthansa is there, and of course, we are carrying cargo as well. So we have to share the market. But the market is big. It was growing by, uh, let's say, five, six hundred percent. In the beginning, somebody who is working in forwarding business told me they have 500 tons cargo, air cargo per year. This is what we have, meanwhile, weekly. 
So it's growing rapidly. Domestic airlines have a two-fare system, one for the Vietnamese and another more expensive one for foreigners. The nation's adaption to a free enterprise system has meant less government control of the economy. The same is not true of education. Although changing the curriculum in schools is still dictated by socialist doctrines. The obvious advantage of a centrally planned educational system is that everyone learns how to read and write. Until recently, high school students who excelled could expect to attend a university in an Eastern Bloc country. That opportunity seems increasingly outmoded. The government's trying to introduce new educational opportunities now by inviting universities from Western Europe and the United States to open up branches here. The next point is that we're renewing our links with the outside world, with all the countries in that world, as opposed to the old times when we only had contact with socialist countries. Vietnam is a very interesting market for us. Uh, it is a country with a, a big potential in the, uh, the future. Uh, we have opened up uh, one office in uh, Ho Chi Minh City and one office in uh, Hanoi. And uh, one of the main reasons why we have done that, that is because uh, to be able to do business in Vietnam, which has been a very close country for many years, you need to be present in the country. Uh, Vietnam is a resourceful country. Uh, we are talking about a country with um, 68 million people. and uh, They have a coastline of a 3,200 kilometers, and we have uh, oil here, which they are exploring. We have uh, coal, minerals, rubber, and rice. Vietnam, two years ago, became the third biggest net exporter of rice in the world. Since Doi Moi was introduced in 1985-86, Vietnam has turned its trade balance from a $1 billion deficit to a $2.5 billion surplus. Recently, exports of crude oil have surpassed rice as the biggest foreign income earner. But everywhere you look, you'll still find rice. For over a thousand years, 85% of the population has been employed in the production of rice and a few other farm products, with millions of acres of land from the north to the south devoted to agriculture. For these peasants, rice isn't just an export item but the primary staple of their diet. With its extensive coastline and numerous rivers, Vietnam's seafood is rich and varied. The first step in modernizing the fish industry has only recently been taken, the processing of seafood. Especially popular with foreign markets are Vietnam's shellfish, such as shrimp and lobster, and the supply seems vast. The potential for increasing Vietnam's share of this market is enormous. The Japanese and several other Asian countries have shown interest. They've created joint ventures with their Vietnamese counterparts, particularly in the area of fish farms. It's simply a matter of time before Vietnam's infrastructure catches up with its resources. Exporting dried fish is one way of getting around the problem of freezing fish in a badly equipped seafood industry. The problem of drying is easily and efficiently solved simply by making the most of two plentifully available resources, the rooftops and the sun. The Vietnamese have always managed to get by on a primitive subsistence economy, growing their own rice, catching their own fish, 
city dwellers in Hanoi pull in their own dinner from the city's own rivers or work as hired hands for the larger seafood companies. They do no longer have to listen to the planning commission. They can decide for themselves what to produce, what technology to use, and what prices they are going to charge their products. So it is a complete sort of a liberalization of the management of the country. For that reason, may I say that we have had very good results. You can see that when the market mechanism is allowed to operate, the production goes up. Our balance of payment now stands at about four times it used to be. It's roughly about two point and something billion dollars per year. It's still very, very small, but for Vietnam, this is a very significant increase. The nation's labor force is low paid, literate, and eager to learn factors which explain Vietnam's dramatic growth in just one year. The textile industry here, which is uh, very labor consuming, and the labor costs are low, so many companies are coming here with uh, doing joint ventures for, for uh, making shirts, jeans. For the type of products we are doing, for instance, from our factory, we see, see an enormous market because it's non-existent, this type of products. We are going to make windows of all types of extruded aluminium profiles and also doors. The people have the basic education, which is quite unique for a country like this. Everybody knows how to read and write. I mean, if you start an industry here, you have to prepare to train people. Uh, you must have a trustable partner that you feel is in your side towards the governments and towards the authorities when you, when you start up a business. If you manage to do that, you have a very good chance to make a success here. And the government is giving very good provisions for investors here. It's one of the most liberal investment laws in, in the Asian region. Doors and windows in aluminum could be a good product for Vietnam because the climate in Vietnam is a little bit special. Necessity is the mother of invention, and this is particularly true of the poorly equipped back alley welders and makeshift repair shops. These characterize the majority of small businesses in the cities. Compare that with the high-tech production plants that are churning out TV sets and VCRs. These are produced at a cost that is far lower than at comparable plants in other Asian countries. This is based on two factors much lower wages and the fact that these are built for domestic consumption. The problems foreign entrepreneurs face in setting up a company are not negligible. It usually comes down to a test of time, patience and commitment. It's a big country with a lot of raw materials. What they need is investments and infrastructures. What they're doing now, they're trying to go from a purely agricultural economy and a hand-to-mouth economy into phase number two, which is developing an industry, food processing, for example, out of agriculture. So it will be a rush towards this country because manpower is still cheaper here now than anywhere else in Asia. And it's not a very skilled manpower, but it's a willing-to-work manpower so they can catch up real fast. Today it's rare to see a company with a computer, although that's fast changing. Last year, small PCs sold at a rate of 900 to 1,000 a month. Only the banks have access to more powerful computers, but that situation is likely to change in future. In some countries like Australia, like Singapore recently, and some others, like France also, uh, would say that, well, there's no reason why they should any longer. Uh, follow the American embargo. So that helped us a lot in uh, having a direct investment from abroad. We say in Vietnam that we start by the uh, economic renovation, which is Doi Moi. The Doi Moi, that is to say the renovation, is, of course, in every field. But we start with economic aspect. Because of the context of the war before, the division created by uh, foreign powers and uh, imposing in us, see, the uh, difference of ideology.
bustling with activity day and night, Saigon Port Harbour at the mouth of the Ho Chi Minh River has dramatically increased its business following a recent expansion. Ships used to have to wait outside the harbour for docking space, wasting time and money. The facility's profits were up by 20% over last years and officials today proudly point to the taxable income they've generated for the government. Now, in short, there are three ways by which you can cooperate in Vietnam. The first is called business cooperation, which simply means that we can have a scheme in which we share the production, which is called production sharing, or management participation. The second form of cooperation is called the joint venture. In this case, a foreign firm and a Vietnamese firm get together, they merge into a new one. The third one is a 100% foreign capital. If you have 100% capital, you can have 100% management as well. For the last two years and a half, we have something like $2.5 billion of invested capital here in Vietnam. This floating hotel is a new landmark in Ho Chi Minh City. So the hotel was built six years ago in Singapore. Uh, it was built as really as a floating hotel. And then at one stage it was operated in the Great Bear Reef in Australia. So the idea came along that they have the boat towed all the way from Australia, uh, permanently anchored in the Saigon River Bank, and uh, to cater to the needs of the uh, this open economy, where you have a lot of uh, foreigners coming into this country to do business now. Few hotels come close to the floating hotel. You can count the good ones on one hand, and most of these are foreign-owned. The lack of adequate hotels is a serious concern to the government. Efforts are being made to attract foreign investors and management know-how. The Swedes, French and Japanese are planning the groundwork in both Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City. I think the gateway for many years will still be Ho Chi Minh City and then from there people will go to Vung Tau, normally they would go to Nha Trang, Da Nang and Hue. And of course out of Hanoi uh, you have one of the great wonders of the world and that's Ha Long Bay which is absolutely beautiful. Now in the northern part of Vietnam you will see more cultural destination where you have more historical backgrounds, you have more uh, scenic spots. You don't have to be an expert to realize that Vietnam would make an attractive tourist destination. But tourism is particularly sensitive to infrastructural problems. The lack of a service mentality also poses a problem. Customs officials and immigration authorities at the airports are slow. Transportation within the country is poor and hotel beds are inadequate. On the other hand, it's safe, the people are friendly and it's a fascinating and multi-layered society. For the adventurous, with patience and a sense of humor, Vietnam is incomparable. Where is Doi Moi leading? In a word or two, towards change. The winds of change are blowing in Vietnam. Some aspects of Vietnam will never change. But much of what you see today may be gone tomorrow. Good morning, Vietnam.